the person who does a lot of work with this is the person who probably should come up here and speak in regard to it. So without any further delay, I'm going to have Annie come up, and she's going to virtually kind of think, walk you through the process of what we do when it comes to that moment when a funeral is being scheduled and when we're talking about what goes into the planning of the funeral mass. So without any delay, further delay, Annie? Well, hi, everyone. Excuse me for this formal uh, stance here. Um, at least you could see me over the podium, which is good. Usually I have to stand on my tiptoes. But um, So uh, first, I'd just like to say how happy I am to be here and um, how honored I am to um, be in the presence of all of you who are such holy men and women. And um, your lives, in many ways, have spoken to me in my ministry throughout uh, my time here at St. George's. Um, so, um, one of the things that I'd like to talk about a little is the time um, leading up to this funeral mass. Um, you might have spoken about some of the um, uh, pr before death types of things um, previously in the other two sessions. So, um, I didn't, um, I came to a little bit of the first one and then couldn't get to the second one. So maybe we could start out if each of you tell me a little bit about um, what struck you or what remains on your heart about the first two sessions that you already um, had here. Um, what was that uh, like for you? Um, just a couple of words. So if we could, again, and you can always pass if you don't want to say anything. How's that? So can you just start us off and tell me a little bit about what the first two sessions were like so that I get a sense of where I fit in to all of that? Well, it kind of forced me to think about things that I don't want to think about. Okay. In a, in a good way. Okay. But good. Probably not to have to address it for a while, but something to, you know, start to put into motion. Sure, sure. Great to know. Okay. <clears throat> How about anybody else? Thoughts about what the first two sessions were like? Anything new did you learn? I was absent. I was okay. Absent. <laughs> okay. So you're starting out where I'm starting out. Yes. All right. Perfect. Now, so good for me. To, the tree. Good for me to know. All right. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, to make sure that the people who are going to take care of you know what your wishes are. Yeah. Okay. You should talk a, a, ahead of time and plan the things. Exactly. You know? Yes, yes. Very important. Good to, good to know that that was said. How about you, Joan? Any thoughts? Uh, I think not having family, I feel more pressure to probably do something. And I wasn't at the first session. Okay. So the second session I found was very helpful as far as knowing that the funeral home, if they have what you want there, yeah. then it makes it easier on the person who's making the arrangements, too. Exactly. And I'm sure that's going to be true here in the parish, too. Okay. They know. okay. But it's just a matter of doing it. Sure, <laughs> sure. Nothing, just get things in order. <laughs> yeah. You know, so there's no problems with your children. Okay, good to know. The idea, uh, someone else mentioned, just getting going. I, This was what I needed. To know, I know I had to do something, so now I'm ready to do it. Exactly, exactly. Great. Well, the, all those things are good to know, and some of them are already written down on my little cheat sheet here. So um, it's good to know that um, I'm sort of following up on some of the things that you've already um, been exposed to. And Deacon, did you want to say something? I mean, well, to I just out. wanted to say that I think we covered in the first session fairly thoroughly uh, some of the modern funerals that bypass masses and why the mass, the funeral mass, is the preferred way to do it. And we talked about cremation quite a bit. Uh -huh. uh, in the presence of the body at the mass, even in the case of cremation. So we, we covered those kinds of things okay. pretty thoroughly in the first session. Yes, I did hear some of it. I, I was able to come in and um, and that, that was good to know um, that that had been um, covered a little bit. So thank you about, for that. Um, so um, uh, one of the 
uh, interesting things that's happened to me lately is um, I've joined a group of um, Catholic women online. They're from mostly from throughout the United States, but um, uh, a few women from Canada, and they are women who work with very um, vulnerable um, folks through the process of dying. And they um, help people to understand some of what the church is saying about the, the process of dying um, before we get to the point of the funeral. And what's good for me about being part of this group is, as you said, these are subjects that are, are um, easy to push in the back of our minds. And so thinking about our, the process of our dying and um, what comes after that in terms of preparing um, for a funeral mass um, is uh, good for me to think about. One of the things that we're doing together is reading this book called The Art of Dying. And it talks, it was written a long time ago, um, like centuries ago. But it's, it was written by, again, Catholic uh, men and women, holy as yourselves, some of them saints. And they, um, they talked about um, uh, the process of dying within the home, within a family. And so um, now uh, that process sometimes happens in a medical situation. And so that kind of complicates some of the um, some of our Catholic beliefs about um, being um, very present um, in the process of dying. And so it's it's interesting to think about. Um, one of the the the, uh, the the first thoughts that has come up is how medicalized the process of dying can be and um, and how it's scary. And so one of the first things we do is want to um, to to go to the the experts in dying um, who are the doctors. But the first experts in in the whole process of leaving this earth and going to the next was our Catholic priests and um, Catholic folks who um, are leading us in the beginning of our life through baptism all the way to the very end of our lives. And one of the things that I really appreciate and one of the things that they focus on in this book, The Art of Dying, is how important it is to be spiritually prepared for our death. And um, uh, one of the things that it stresses very much is the sacraments that we have, the sacrament of reconciliation and the sacrament of the sick. And I've really appreciated, um, since Father Pagan has come, how um, wonderfully he ministers to those who ask for the sacrament of the sick. And so um, uh, just recently uh, on Sunday, I went to bring uh, Holy Communion to someone and the uh, two daughters met me at the door and they said, oh, he passed away last night. And the wonderful thing for me was that he had said, even in his dementia, that he wanted to see the priest. And as soon as I told Father Pagan, he went right there. And the next um, time I went, the daughters told me what a wonderful thing it was for him, how it gave him peace and comfort in his dying days. And that was, um, I, in my mind, uh, such spiritual preparation then that when what comes next in terms of a mass um, is just flows very naturally um, from the preparation that was done um, previously. And of course, we prepare every Sunday by coming to Mass. And that is, of course, our, our um, the ritual that is the source and summit and preparation for our whole lives. And those um, th these women who work with very um, uh, compromised, physically compromised um, folks who are nonverbal their whole lives 
um, they they pointed out that uh, in their experience traveling with people who are dying and then then die, in their experience they've um, found that even these very simple folks die as they lived. And if they just were there when their parents were praying with them every night, when it came time and they were leaving this earth, those children and, and young people were held peacefully in their parents' arms because they had their parents had instilled somehow a deep faith in them that helped them into the next life. So um, I think that that kind of also brings up in my mind how important it is to share this whole process, the process of dying and the process of planning for death and the process of the planning for the funeral mass with our family and dear friends. And Joan, I know you have many dear friends and, um, and many of us are here. <laughs> so um, I consider um, us um, part of your spiritual family. So um, that uh, means a lot to me and a lot to our whole community. Everything we do um, uh, as we plan this funeral mass is shared and affects our, um, our Catholic community. Um, I know that when people pass away, the members of our community will call me and say, oh my goodness, I heard that so-and-so has passed away. I feel so bad. Is everything okay? Is there anything I can do? And so our whole community is part of this process with all of you. So um, the specifics of, of um, the planning can happen Either we can help our family and friends, or we can pass on our information um, and the things that are important to us for planning a funeral mass. Again, the lives that you have lived speak loudest about what your family, the information your family and friends will use to celebrate this massive Christian burial. So um, people, when, when I have the privilege of planning with people um, from our parish, they'll say things to me like, oh, I know my mother loved this hymn, or I know this was a really special thing to my mom at, uh, at St. George's. And so the, y your lives have already spoken. And um, this is just a simple little part at the end. Um, so, um, the preparation part, you've got a couple of pieces of paper there. So one of the things that um, St. George's has done is prepared this massive Christian burial planning guide. And what we've done with it is we've given it to all the funeral homes that folks from St. George usually go to. And sometimes, and, and the, the understanding is that when you go to the funeral home, uh, you'll get a copy of this. Now, sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes things happen very quickly and the funeral home will give you a different piece of paper uh, to use for planning. Um, but people have said that um, this is very helpful to them because it has everything kind of in one place. So um, the other thing we have available to us in our parish is the website. And the website, if you go to, um, if you click on worship, you'll see a whole section there on funeral planning. And it's got a worksheet, which is that big piece of paper in front of you, which is about the same thing as this front sheet, but just a little different. So um, I'll just kind of um, go through it, if it's OK, and um, uh, talk a little bit about some of the, the questions that come up to me when a family or friends are looking at, at, at this planning. Um, so one of the first things <laughs> sometimes people say is, well, I have no idea what him is what, and I don't know the, the, these titles. So if you go, so I tell them, if you go to the website and just click on the, the title of the song, of the hymn, you can hear it. And so that's, uh, so all of these hymns are on our website, and people can just click on it and hear all of those hymns. And one of the 
the uh, the wonderful things for me, sometimes I go and plan in people's homes and I have my phone and I can click on it on my phone so that everybody planning, because it's not usually one person, some a lot of times it's a couple of people, several people can hear the hymn at the same time and say, oh, I like that. No, I don't like that. Oh, that doesn't fit, that kind of thing. So um, I think that's a, a, a good thing that was added to the planning for the website. So... Um, uh, the first thing they'll ask about is pallbearers. And usually what I say is, uh, it, it all depends, and the funeral home can do it for you if you want. So you don't have to pick pallbearers. If um, someone is cremated, they don't need pallbearers at all. And um, one funeral home just recently um, asked, could they have one pallbearer to carry the ashes in? And Father very kindly and flexibly said that would be okay. He had that family had done that before. So, um, uh, again, the funeral home will do it for you, or you can wait. Or sometimes if we're preparing the program, we can, we can just put in family or friends. So you don't have to put a name in there if you don't want to. Um, the words of reflection, uh, Father might have mentioned, it comes uh, at St. George. We do it at the beginning of the, of the Mass. Um, the Mass technically has not begun yet. The first um, verse or two of the hymn is played. The family are in their seat. The friends are there. And um, the casket has already come down or the ashes are there. And um, the, the funeral uh, home folks will uh, point out to the person doing the reflection, if there is one, and again, it's not required, you don't have to do it, um, uh, the, the time to go up to the pulpit. Um, on the uh, inside cover there, there's a little explanation about words of reflection, and it says, in accordance with the policy of the Diocese of Worcester, it should be a brief written text not to exceed five minutes. There will only be one speaker, and it should consist of a reflection on the Christian life of the deceased. So one of the things that people often ask is, do we have to hand it in? If we write, when we write it out, do we have to hand it in? So just so you know, you don't have to hand it in. But um, it's, I always say it's handy to have it, because even though you think you'll remember everything, when you get up there, it's very difficult and your mind can go blank and it's really nice to have a piece of paper like my little cheat sheet here. Uh, any questions about those things so far? I had a slight question here about the hymns. I yep. Going back to Sure, yeah. Um, there was one that I really, really liked and I brought it here for the bereavement liturgy from the Cape. I uh -huh. heard it at the Cape. Yep. You are mine. But it is a David Haas song yeah uh, is that out out um uh, technically it is but when people bring up um specific questions like that the first thing i do is call father nichols and ask him what he thinks um and he'll he'll tell me what's allowed and what's not and very often he'll refer me to the organist and i'll ask the organist but you, about david haas do you want to speak specifically to that our bishop has said Still, still not allowing, allowing yeah allowing okay yeah okay all right it just yeah so our bishop sent some sent um, uh, information to our parish and asked that we not use hymns that were written by david haas he's had some right. uh, problems in his life and um that's uh, yeah. something that our bishop thinks is important and that is understandable i'm just to, yeah you know, no it's good to know because it's something that i really of course meant a lot to me yes time, yeah so. and sometimes people will ask for hymns that are not here or mm -hmm. are not liturgical hymns and they do have to be liturgical hymns. But there is an option that we often say to the, the folks, um, it's something that you can talk to the funeral home about. You might be able to play that, a CD of that hymn at the um, funeral home, or you can, the funeral home very often makes a video, and sometimes you can say, this hymn I want in my video at the funeral home or at the, the also they they bring um a boom box 
to the grave site and we'll play a hymn. Uh, at the gravesite. So th those are some other options. And sometimes people, when they have their post-funeral reception, some people start with a hymn or a, a, a non-liturgical hymn, a song that the person really liked. So um, I think the wonderful thing is that there's flexibility. And um, the important thing is that it, it means that this um, planning and these choices mean something to um, not just all of us, but the people in the family. Uh, any other questions so far? Words of reflection, hymns? You might think of something and we can chat about it later. Um, the placing of the pall, I think I heard that was explained the first time. Was I right, Deacon? What it was and everything? <coughs> um. We may have mentioned it, but we didn't go into any detail. Okay, okay. So um, the pall is the a, a white cloth that is um, placed on the casket. Um, there is not a cloth um, uh, or a similar ritual followed with ashes, but the, um, the cloth is a symbol of our baptism. It's a white cloth. And um, people are very often concerned about the logistics of how to do all these things at a funeral mass. Like, what do I tell my kids? What do, you know, how does it happen? And the funeral homes are so good at just making, helping it to happen by bringing up the cloth, putting it on the casket, helping people unroll it. And um, it's always very touching to me. Um, uh, you know, I took care of my mom in the process of her dying, and I remember, you know, always adjusting the bed sheets and, and fixing the cloths and everything. And when families unroll that um, beautiful pall, it reminds me of the care that the family has taken for the person who has passed away. So I think it's just such a beautiful ritual. And these rituals, um, uh, touch us, I think, on a very deep level. And sometimes families don't want to go through all of this because it's hard sometimes and it's painful and it brings up things that are not always easy for us to think about or feel. But the ritual is what helps us to really um, go on living a whole life after we bury the um, person that we love so much. Um, so then that's about the Paul. Did I forget anything about the Paul? Military. Ah, military, yes. That, that. Um, so hymn-wise, if anyone's in, um, uh, has been in the service, they're an, invited to um, add a hymn, a national hymn. And um, so that's one of the additional choices of the hymns at the, towards the end. And um, th those rituals, the ritual with the flag is done. Um, is it ever done in church? No. It it's always done at the website, at the uh, gravesite. gravesite. Yeah. Um, uh, <clears throat> we, just, we just bring the flag into church folded. Mm. In our diocese, we allow it to be placed at the into the casket. Okay. So okay. So uh, place it there. Place it on the casket. Uh, but they come into church that way. They have to fold it up, take it off. Okay. The, the funeral pall is what takes precedence in the church. And then what's over, they may do the same thing before they actually leave the church and put the casket into the, uh, into the hearse. Okay. And, the funeral, the flag back. and that national hymn, Father, that's sung when the casket is halfway down and no, uh, no, we do it usually before we even leave the church. Okay. So after okay. the, it would be when the, I think for a minute. The, the final hymn is finished? Yeah, when, when we, when we do it, um, no, it's before the final hymn. It's when after the prayers of commendation are through. Okay. Then we do oh. it, and then we go into the, the closing hymn. Okay, okay, thank you. Does that sort of answer the question? Pretty much. Um, so are there two closing hymns? Well, there are two closing hymns. What they do is they'll play it after we finish the prayers, mm -hmm. commendation, before they go into the closing hymn. 
they will do a national hymn. One of the hymns that was mentioned there in the, you know, in the, in the God, they will do it then. Then when that's the hymn, then they'll go into the final hymn, and then they'll go into the Okay, thank you. All right. Um, then uh, there's um, the readings. So the readings that are set out in the, what's it called? The USC, the, the, the right of... A right of Christian burial. Right of Christian burial. These, all these readings are directly from that right of Christian burial. So it's not like um, Father picked out some readings he likes or um, the bishop dictated anything. These are all readings that are set out um, by the commission that writes these kinds of things. <laughs> right. when, they, when, they, when they compose the... Uh, what I to do is maybe we'll give us a copy of it upstairs and it might help to... Sure. And so there's a right of baptism, right? Mm. That's everything's all set out. And there's the right of Christian burial. And there's those three parts of the um, of all the rituals. There's correct me now if I don't get this right, Deacon. There's the prayers at the um, uh, the calling hours. If you have calling hours, right? Right. And then there's the right of Christian burial. And then there's the prayers at the grave site. And all of those prayers <coughs> and all of that is. Um, uh, prescribed ahead of time. And um, so the deacon has those prayers and prays them at the at the grave site when the burial takes place. All right. Um, so sometimes people will will read all of those and and <coughs> it's very difficult and it does and nothing strikes them. So I just always ask folks, well, is there a certain reading or a certain thought or whatever that you have that you want to include, and somehow, and sometimes we can work together. And um, you know, sometimes Father is is flexible about um, the readings. But uh, Father uh, uh, pick or the deacon will pick the gospel, and very often some of the points that don't get covered in readings, if I tell Father or de or deacon about it, and they're doing the homily, they can include that. So we try to include the things that are important to families as best we can. Any questions about the readings? There's the. This is the. This is the book that we use. Of course, we use this for every funeral, but this is from where all the readings are found, all the prayers are found, for various circumstances that go all the way from the wake, the vigil, the funeral hall, all the way to the conclusion to committal at the cemetery. So everything is found in here. What you find in there has been taken from this. Okay. And um, one of the things that I was um, thinking about, too, was the prayers of the faithful. Sometimes family members w want to take part in writing some of those. Father's very flexible. I let Father know, and he says, have them write out what they want to include. I give it to Father, and he um, prepares it and it's read by the deacons. Sometimes a family member wants to read it and it's read can be read by one family member. Um, I think I think I've covered everything. Sometimes people um, have another hymn that they want to include. And um, sometimes it might be appropriate for a a, um, a communion meditation hymn. And again, I talked to Father about it. I talked to Mike Garceau about it. And if it fits, he'll let us put in a communion meditation. One of the little glitches that sometimes happens with the hymns, the communion hymn has to come from this list of communion hymns on here because it has to be about communion. So some of the other hymns are interchangeable. You can do opening and closing all from that one list. but. The communion hymn really has to talk about communion. And so sometimes if people wanted something else at the communion, we'll do that as a communion meditation. And the communion hymn, they'll pick another communion hymn there. All right? Um, sometimes, uh, in terms of hymns, sometimes family members have family uh, 
uh, people in their family that they want to uh, join in the be, to be a cantor or join in in terms of, uh, of doing the hymns. And um, again, we refer it to Father. Father refers it to Michael Garso. If they're a professional singer who's who are used to the um, the parts of the mass and what needs to be covered by the canter, then that that can sometimes work out. But again, it's one of those things that we have to work out behind the scenes. And um, the same is true um, in terms of video, especially during COVID when things were so difficult and people did not have, in many cases, the um, the ability to even have a funeral mass and, so, and sometimes, um, or their family members couldn't come, our videographer very kindly um, recorded some of those masses and um, uh, they were able to, the families were able to share it with their other family members. And some families nowadays have friends and family that live all the way across the country and they just can't get here very quickly. And so to have that is just a, a wonderful gift to our parish and we're very fortunate that um, uh, we have that. And uh, I know of some family members who treasure that um, that video uh, so much because they can watch it sometimes afterwards. Um, sometimes, you know, we're so filled with emotion during the mass and um, people, especially those who have been married for many, many years, um, are happy to have that, that tape and to be able to look at it again and again. Yeah. Is there a YouTube, a YouTube for, uh, uh, to cover this lightly? In other words, uh, to all, cover the all, planning, all the steps, it's all, all the oh. steps you're covering, or or a mass itself. Uh huh. Um, you know, maybe a question way out there, but uh, could, sure could be useful because there are people living away. Mm hmm. Go. Yeah. And uh, and other people. Mm hmm. Well, this is going to be. Uh, think uh, they'll receive communion. And so sure. Sure. Yeah. So. Um, uh this these particular sessions will be online but the but the specifics of planning a funeral liturgy are so uh, varied and um so different that it only makes sense to sit down with someone from the parish and go through all of these things so um that's one of the treasures that i have in my um uh, work here at the parish to be able to go and sit in the living rooms with people to sit around the kitchen table to um to be able to work with people to to do this plan and if any of you want to do it ahead of time i'm happy to come to your house to sit down with you down here whatever you want i can walk you through all of it and we can answer the questions that only you, will come up only for you so um does that kind of answer the question you think so okay um the um the 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 mass leaflet is is put together here at the parish so i put together the leaflet and then I, I email it to the funeral home. And I email it to Father, who um, sets all of the readings up and everything on the pulpit so that everything is prepared, so that everybody at the funeral home knows everything, and the organist knows everything. And um, usually it all comes together, right, Deacon? <laughs> and, and when I make a mistake and, and click on the wrong reading to print off, the Deacon is good enough to help me figure the whole thing out. So uh, between all of us, we work together as a team, and um, uh, families and friends have been very grateful that their church is here for them. Um, not every church has this process. Um, not every parish is wealthy enough to be able to support all these people from the anointing of the sick to the, 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 the mass and the planning and, and the, the personal um, presence at the gravesite. Not every parish can do that for people now. And so we are just so fortunate to have 
a community that supports us to be able to do all of these very important things that I really believe helps people to process this whole um, huge part of their life. And then, of course, the bereavement liturgy that happens at the end um, of that year for, for many people that's put together by Joan and her team um, helps people to, to put closure and to um, uh, come to a new place of peace when this is all done. I'd like to say just something about someone that I spoke with, you know, in preparation for this bereavement literature. Uh -huh. And it was a person in Hawaii. Uh -huh. And I did not have an address <clears throat> for him, but I had a telephone number. So I called. Uh -huh. and we had a conversation. And he, um, he was very pleased that he was made aware of the fact that we were going to light a candle for his relative or uh, whatever. Yeah. And we, he talked for quite a while. In fact, he was driving. He pulled over. And he sat and talked for a while. And then he called again to say that he had notified, he had told me he was going to notify people here who had known this person. Uh -huh. And he said he did, but he did not receive any yeses. Oh, so he yeah. let me know, you know yeah. about that. So, yeah. And he, <clears throat> it was a testimonial to you and to Father that, you know, what a wonderful experience it was to... Mm -hmm you know, how gracious you people were and how kind to him, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, if I'm, if I'm uh, thinking of the same person, the uh, woman's first name was Marie. Yes. And uh, she lived a holy life. Yes. And she, uh, that, her nephew, all the way in Hawaii, wanted to express what a holy life she had lived and how that had affected him. And so he between Hawaii and the plane and uh, planning here, um, it all came together. But again, it was her holy life. She had been anointed several times um, by uh, Father Charles. So again, it's, it's just these, you know, people who have uh, received the Eucharist. And um, uh, I love the, 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 the phrase, um, Vi viaticum, am I saying it right? And it's the last Eucharist, um, and it's called the food for the journey. And it's just such a such a beautiful um, gift that our church gives to all of us um, to be able to share with one another. So, any questions? Yeah. Just a procedural question. Yep. If there's a post mass cremation involved, how does that impact? the gravesite service or does it eliminate that option altogether because that's obviously not going to happen right after the mass. So. Right, yeah. And and uh, uh, the burial doesn't always happen right after the mass. Sometimes even if it's a body, it, it the funeral the um gravesite might be in another city. Um, so it just happens at another time and the funeral home does all the arrangements. That was the situation for my mom. She wanted her body to be present in the church and um, she was cremated afterwards and then um, the funeral home called us and we called, uh, they called the de a deacon for us and we met the deacon at the grave site and, um, and uh, the, carried the ashes from the funeral home to the grave site ourselves and um, had a, a, a beautiful ending to to that situation. The parish could still support that even though it's yes. a separate day. Yes, yeah, okay. yep. And the deacon very often, they'll call him and he graciously takes care of it. So. Thank you. Annie, I want to just mention the, the team that Father's put together for, of servers because I, mm, when you talk yes. about um, being a parish family and the, the support, <laughs> I think it means a lot to families, uh, especially when they know personally uh, those adults who are on that serving team. But even if they don't, they've they've probably seen them at mass, yes. and it is it's just one more kind of yes. family connection. Absolutely, uh, they do a great job, and yeah, they they really they come in early, they light the charcoal, they move the Paschal candle, yes. and do all of the. The, the details required so that, uh, you know, when yes. we walk out there, we just walk out there. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. As I just might mention, of course, one of our servers is the man behind the camera there. <laughs> I just served a few of those. Yes. Yeah. 
And Father is again is wonderfully flexible. Um, one of the funerals that we've just recently had had an altar server who is now a, a, a is he in college. He's working. He just graduated from college. Oh, just graduated yeah. from college, and he was an altar server. And he asked if he could come back and serve his grandmother's funeral, and Father very graciously said yes. So it's those kinds of personal. Um, wonderful things that that happen here that um, certainly have um, fed my faith um, so any other questions so my phone number is everywhere in the bulletin so feel free to call me anytime you want and uh, it doesn't matter what time of day or night I usually always have that phone in my pocket so I'm happy to make arrangements to to um, come and sit with you and do any of this work that you want to do um, or even if you just have any questions and want to talk about it happy to do it um, in terms of the the process of dying that we started out with and how um, what a spiritual thing that is there are um, people in this parish who um, were dying and their family members called and asked could someone from the parish come and help us even just sit with the person when they were going through the whole process of dying and so that's something that our outreach is happy to do we have mm -hmm. gone and sat there in a, that very wonderful um, sacred place and um, been there with people for uh, you know a, f a few days a few hours um, as they are dying so so those persons are they trained to do that? Is there a special training? Uh, the, uh, the only person who's done it that I know of so far is me. And yes, I was, <laughs> I was trained. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, also, we work with hospice people. Yeah. The hospice right. people call us all the time. And they, uh, um, so we, if, if, if it's not something that I could do, it's something that we can make, we can connect other people medical people it's up to approval. do approval approval i mean a what least a person I, i'm familiar with hospice training sure yeah i haven't done it yeah but uh is is, is that a requirement yes okay yeah someone if someone is going to be there um when someone is dying they really should have that there's a they're, like they're a certificate person. kind of thing you get and sometimes it's been in our bulletin over the past years, not so much since COVID, but um, if people wanted to get that training, um, they could volunteer to do that. All right? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. I guess I might say we thank all of you for whether you've been here just today or you've been here for all three or two of the three sessions that uh, we thank you very much for uh, sharing of your time and being here for this and uh, certainly it's grateful we're grateful to it and uh, glad to know that you know folks are certainly taking this i don't want to say seriously i think taking it more wholeheartedly and uh, to to know that you know this is important to be able to do and to plan so that as Annie has said, you know, when you come to this time, when you come to those moments, and you want to be sure that your wishes are going to be carried out, that you do it and be sure that you do it well in advance so that whoever is going to be having the responsibility of carrying out your wishes will know what they are and will carry them out in, in the way that they know that if you were standing right there next to them, that you would be satisfied with everything that was done. So once again, Thank you. If you've got any other questions, you know, uh, we certainly can answer those for you, whether they're here or at a later time. But again, I'm very grateful for the fact that you've taken the time in today and in the past two weeks to be here.